what a joy to have an opportunity to celebrate Bernardo Walcott's The Long Emancipation um, and the longest significant of many that we're still struggling with, right? But what I, what I want to say, though, is just maybe talk a little bit about the various encounters we've had, which solidify my respect for you as a scholar, uh, solidifies um, the kind of person, the kind of man I know you are, the kind of intellectual I know you have been consistently. So we met, as you know, years ago, and those of you who are listening in, um, this is a nice piece of, of, of um, history, I suppose. But I met Ronaldo years ago when he was a grad student at York. Uh, and the book, um, the first collection on, on Caribbean women's, um, on Caribbean women's, women's writing out of the Kumbh had just been published. And he was so excited about this. And actually, I was at an MLA in uh, Toronto, and he happily found a way to find me and, and was so excited about it and wanted to talk about it and so on. And after that, uh, we kept in touch, um, and significantly, I was invited to be uh, one of his examiners for his dissertation, which interestingly was on hip hop, right? At the, in the early days of hip hop, he was looking at how hip hop uh, could be used in the educational process, because that's the framework out of which he was working then, right? And fascinatingly, too, um, he had a number of interesting scholars, Black British scholars, who were also part of the committee. But after the exam, we went to a gay bar for celebration. So there you go. We see a conjunction happening already in which Ronaldo was already um, declaring himself uh, as a man who was comfortable in his sexuality, his sexual identity, his scholarship, his ethnicity, all of the origins, his African origins and all of that. So that's how I read Ronaldo. So um, after that, though, we've had a really interesting professional encounters. And I want to highlight one of them. This is a book I did when I was first um, hired as Director of African Legal Studies at Florida International University. And we had a couple of conferences there. And one of them was part of that project, which now many people talk about decolonizing, but we were talking about it back then, decolonizing the academy, if you can see it, is the title of that book. And we were looking at how African diaspora studies actually decolonizes the academy. So one of the scholars who was part of that um, project uh, which we have to say is an ongoing project still because we are still all in that process of decolonizing the academy, um, is Ronaldo Walker. This is what Ronaldo concludes uh, in his essay, which is published in this collection. And I want to hopefully um, tell people that it's worth going back to look at not just his essay, but the entire collection because of what it tried to do back then. It was published in 2003. But Ronaldo's paper was Beyond the Nation Thing, Black Studies, Cultural Studies, and Diaspora Discourse, or the Black, sorry, or the post-Black Studies moment, right? So he was looking at the way in which cultural studies was coming into the sort of academic forefront, uh, but not in a way in which Stuart Hall and the others in, in London who had come out of Birmingham had imagined it, but becoming more like a kind of vanity project with a few scholars looking at different projects, but not really engaging with the politics of place, the political situations in which these things were embedded and so on. So Ronaldo was one of those who was really making a claim for how are we going to read all of this? How are we going to read all of these offshoots? How are we going to look at the ways in which various studies, as in IE African American studies, for example, um, in a way remained very narrowly focused and not picking up on the ways in which the question of the diaspora uh, informed African-American studies or the way in which we are all interrelated, interconnected mm -hmm. in scholarly kinds of contexts. Of course, that has been clarified more recently in the ways in which um, the scholars, uh, Gleason, James, Claudia Jones, um, Sylvia Winter and others have been taken up within these larger fields, right? But back then, this is Ronaldo really making a claim to say, if we're looking at Black diaspora, if we're looking at African diaspora studies, then we have to really account for the various conjunctures, the interconnections that we share. So this is how he concludes it. And I just want to read that little bit from, from his essay. The economy of Blackness and therefore Black studies must expand uh, diaspora discourses that can mediate between the politics of nation and home, 
and recognize the something more of Blackness are imperative in this moment when the collapse of a large scale social movement is evident and the nation state as we knew it in the eventful moment of Black studies institutionalization is waning in the face of global capital's demands. Nations have not outlived their purposes despite celebrations that often seem to suggest so. Nations are also not all we require. But to give the last word to Canadian poet Dion Brand, it is sometimes useful to know when to give up land to light on in quotes. That's Ronaldo. And you can see that last reference to Dion Brand is also very significant because one of the things one admires about uh, Dion Brand is that his colleague dedication to writing has also been really fundamental to making sure that writers in that Black Canadian space, Dion Brand in particular, Austin Clark as well, were really identified, known, studied, written about uh, conferences organized around symposia, discussions, panels, and so on. So I, I see a really interesting nexus between his work and that of Dion Brand in terms of the scholarly inquiry, the scholarly encounter, the, the definitely the intellectual relationship and friendship, but also the advancement of a particular mode of doing criticism that comes from Canada. So what I want to say, I suppose, in all of this is that what, uh, what um, Ronaldo has done is really put this whole logic of a Black Canadian discourse on the map. And he has done this in his various um, types of intellectual work, his work on queer returns and property, I'm reading some of them, of course, the long emancipation and so on. This is a phenomenal contribution therefore, Ronaldo, and I compliment you, I congratulate you on doing this kind of work. And I wanna say they'll be proud because the Caribbean radical intellectual tradition is manifested in your presence, in your work, in your ideas, in your amazing contributions and, and education and critique of the ways in which the academy loves to hold many of these um, um, imperial frameworks in place, even as they claim to be doing transformative kinds of work. So one of the things we said in decolonizing uh, the academy is that the academy is both. It has that place then for intellectual work that is um, transformative, but it also can re-turn um, us to, if we're not careful, to some of the fundamental um, um, disciplinary structures that we were really um, working against or working to not be trapped in, in those plantations of the academic context in which uh, we work. And I, I wanna say many of us still feel that the academy is, functions in some ways, if you let it, as that kind of space that actually captures you. So one has to be really clear about how transformative knowledge that helps one move beyond um, being complicit with um, academic nonsense, academic bullshit, and the ways in which uh, scholars sometimes begin to make themselves believe that because they work in the academy and they work in a certain kind of context that this now defines the identity. No, we are saying no to all of that. So Ronaldo Walker, con uh, congratulations on the publication of this work. And I'm looking forward to a lot more from you and sending you a lot of love and hoping that um, I get to see you in person eventually because now we do everything remotely, but we wanna be sure that we keep the live contacts also in place. Uh, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Apparently, I was still on screen, but I uh, will now give it over to uh, give the space over to our first speaker, Warren Critchlow. Okay. Um, thanks so much, uh, Christopher. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Good. Thanks so much, Christopher, and the um, organizers other organizers, your organizing team for inviting me to participate in this afternoon's gathering around Ronaldo's Walcott, Ronaldo Walcott's long emancipation toward uh, black freedom. Professor Walcott's short book, um, indeed a critical essay, is, com is comprised of what I would call 22 riffs or variations on conditions of black freedom in relation to uh, emancipation. His interlocutors range from uh, Fanon to Sylvia Winter, uh, from CLR James to Dion Brand, uh, 
from Sadia Hartman to Christina Sharp, among many other scholars, working across histories of Black studies and its most uh, contemporary debates. Walcott writes uh, to academic colleagues, but his work is decidedly rooted in activist practices of Black Lives Matter and other movements on the ground across the diaspora. From various vantage points uh, to include uh, Black death, diaspora, ontology, funk, Black studies, among others, Walcott insistently argues that emancipation is far from freedom. Mainstream historians contend that 19th century abolition acts ending slavery for the enslaved in the British Empire and the American Emancipation uh, Proclamation of, of uh, January 1st, 1960, 1863, constitute the greatest constitutional transformations uh, in Western liberal democracies. To the contrary, Walcott uh, vigorously disputes this claim. He maintains that these juridical forms, the legal processes of emancipation and extension of civil rights are far from freedom. Uh, freedom for peoples of uh, black uh, global diasporas remain, he says, a stormy paradoxical, not yet. Early in the essay, Walcott proposes uh, the fundamental question and I quote, what then, what then is freedom? What am I defining as freedom? How do I demarcate why and how black peoples do not yet have something called freedom? I understand emancipation as always embedded, as always embedded in juridical, that is administration of law and thus always orienting uh, toward delimiting uh, freedom. Here Walcott points to the fecklessness of, fickleness of law the partisan uh, socially constructed nature of juridical uh, processes that are always already partial processes skewed towards power and subject uh, to paradoxical interpretation and uh, application. Slavery for the formerly enslaved may have been ended on paper, but simultaneously other legal means reinscribed freed people into a state of unfreedom, of peonage, fragile, a citizenship, a questionable recognition, questionable recognition on the margins of what uh, it could mean to live humanly, what specifically uh, what, what Walcott calls black livability requires. In this sense, the long emancipation is an essay written exp explicitly to break with historical relations and thinking that tie, uh, as Walcott states, uh, black people to a regimen of the slave and plantation logics and economies. Black freedom is not yet, but Walcott is committed to what uh, a black freedom might demand. And he says, I quote, I define freedom as always being a uh, human in the world that exists beyond the realm of the juridical and that follow bodily individual uh, uh, sovereignty. I argue that freedom marks an individual and a collective desire to be in common and indifference in a world that is non-hierarchical and non-violent. It marks as well the social, political, and imaginative conditions that make uh, possible multiple ways of being in the world. The long eman emancipation mounts a sustained intervention into ongoing conditions of Black unfreedom in the Americas and elsewhere. And of course, uh, we can extend uh, this, uh, these provocations into the current condition of, um, of, of, of diaspora people uh, living in the war zone um, in, in currently going on in Europe. Its provocations are uncompromising, pushing the reader to ways of thinking and reflecting on multiple modes uh, and ways by which black people have made, improvised and experimented with the possibility of being in the world. That is of trying to define and articulate freedom for themselves. And in this way to bring new modes of freedom into the world. Riff number 17 or chapter number 17, newness for example, um, is one I want to, to turn to uh, with its interest in the role of music uh, in the production of ideas and practices of black livability. 
uh, for Walcott, uh, who describes growing up in the 1970s uh, with the thickness of funk music in the air, uh, the funky, uh, he calls it, the body odor, uh, the serious danceable music. These are all wonderful allusions to the language of the time. Either, Walcott recalls, one smelled bad, uh, meaning nasty, or one was a bad dancer, meaning you could uh, you could funk, you could get down. Funk was always something uh, to call to call us into some kind of action. What is important here, as Walcott writes, uh, <clears throat> the content of cultural production, the multiplicity of style, language, sound, music, the funk of the time, um, and in this funk we get a fundamental sense of the way black people take hold of their bodies, demonstrating a sense of autonomy and uh, self-creation beyond imposed scripts of what black life should be, well beyond prescriptions of white supremacist logics that extend from the 19th century into the 20th century, and indeed uh, into the, uh, our current uh, 21st century. Perhaps growing up uh, a generation earlier, I also marveled at the power of, of music, the music of the late 1950s and the early 1960s post-bop revolution in sound. It was in that music that the question of freedom and what it could mean uh, that expanded in, in, in condom in, in tandem with uh, the moments of global uh, independence movements in Africa and the global south, and also in the civil rights period with its rising tide of black nationalism and black power, shifting the very nature of black freedom seeking in the Americas. Uh, for me, one signature work that encapsulates this moment uh, is uh, We Insist, Max, Roach, Mac, Max Roach's Freedom Now Suite, uh, written by Max Roach and Oscar uh, Brown Jr. and issued in 1960, the work built on Duke Ellington's earlier inquiry into the meaning of freedom, black, brown, and beige from 1943. We insist, asks musically and discursively many of the questions the long emancipation insists upon asking now about freedom. In fact, Roach recollected uh, in an interview with Ingrid uh, Munson that the Freedom Now suite was never really finished, he said. We really didn't know at the time what uh, freedom, uh, what it really means to, to be free. Um, the Long Emancipation is, I think, an important uh, book. It's not a book for the, for the faint hearted. It departs from any reliance on the reigning ideas of, of, of contemporary philosophy or contemporary philosophy, or the kinds of discourses that um, engage us uh, in, the, in the academy. It's a work that bravely, I think, moves outside of those discourses and makes its own claims on thinking, its own claims on knowledge, its own claims on articulation, and its own, own claims on a particular kind of, of politics. I want to read one final, uh, by way of conclusion, one final uh, part from chapter 17, which I think lies at the very core of, of Walcott's arguments in this, in this small text. Um, since the body of work has either been silent on or elided the history of black unfreedom, even as black unfreedom haunts uh, its own conceptualizations of freedom, I seek to do something different uh, by resisting engaging in engaging it uh, as a way to uncover that which remains continually silent. Funk is a prime example of the way black life deconstructs the limits of Euro-American modernist humanism. And I think this is a, a text uh, that will uh, push us and encourage us to engage further in that way of, in that, that work of deconstructing the limits of Euro-American uh, modernist humanism. Uh, in our practices and in our politics and in the way that we work in the university, but also extend that work in our relations to the movements in the street. Thank you very much.
And now we have uh, Dr. Sarah Stefana Smith. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I first I wanna start with just some thanks. Um, thank you to my fellow roundtablers, Chris and Warren. I'm thrilled to be in conversation for you. And of course, um, a, a special thank you to Ronaldo Walcott, my mentor, as well as Christopher for the invitation to be in conversation. Um, so I, I kind of want to make two sort of moves um, with which to sort of think about the resonance of this work, long emancipation um, in my life and in my intellectual work. And the first that I want to do is think a little bit about um, pedagogy um, and then move towards my intellectual work. Um, so in I'm, I'm currently teaching a class called Black Sexual Economies. And in the opening weeks, I um, have students read keyword entries in the spirit of Wayne, Raymond Williams, specifically race, sex, and economy, alongside the first three chapters of Long Emancipation. And the motivation behind this is to orient a particular kind of conversation that invite us to think about multiple entanglements that circulate and undergird how we might even come to understand multivocal Black um, experience in the contemporary moment. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I'm, I think I'm thinking very much full circle, both as a student of Ronaldo and then someone who now has students of their own that, I'm, that are working through some of these same kinds of questions. And those first three to five chapters in many, many ways kind of really um, reveal um, the stakes um, in, a, in a really sort of explicit way. One being, um, you know, if, if not freedom, what is it? And what do we do with that when having to sort of on the first hand contend with a seismic shift in what um, Walcott calls um, the human alterability of how we even come to understand what it means to be a subject or a human. And so you're asking undergrad students to think about some of those tensions within the context of a course like a Black Sexuality Studies course that's coming in contact with questions of political economy and, um, and the navigation between um, hope and hopelessness when having to sort of think about freedom and the stakes of that. And so what I find most useful and helpful as sort of thinking about myself as an educator is framing um, sort of the importance of thinking through that first element of the seismic shift, as well as entanglements that always invite us to think about transatlantic slavery and colonialism as historical entanglements that have everything to do with the contemporary moment. And then finally, the ways in which um, diaspora as an analytic, but more particularly as a politic becomes a very useful sort of configuration. And so I wanna now turn to the passage that I um, chose to focus on in, in order to sort of think through um, the, my, my own sort of intellectual work. And it's, it's also quite interesting. I'm sort of thinking about some of the other um, panelists, certainly Cara Boyce Davies, who points to this text, Decolonizing the Academy, which I also um, make effort to teach and, I, and, and um, brings me to thinking of one of Ronaldo's first books, Black Like Who, and, and the particular sort of iteration of the Niagara movement where you have this conversation with the boys and you have this moment where um, that work was already a sort of diasporic encounter. And what does it mean to sort of think about the stakes of place and space within a kind of larger historical context? So the two, the, the passage that um, I focused on comes out of um, intervention six, chapter six, diaspora studies. And I'm really thinking about that chapter as well as chapter seven, the Atlantic region and 1492. Um, and so the passage that I'm looking at specifically comes on page 24 and 25, where Ronaldo states, quote, transatlantic slavery is more than a political economic phenomena. It is more than the history of early capital accumulation. It is a seismic human cultural shift in economy, thought, and culture, thus in human alterability. 
Transatlantic slavery, along with the brutal theft of indigenous territories, is the engine that has driven capital and its various global incarnations for the past 500 years. The manner in which European and indeed global thought changed in the context of transatlantic slavery um, beyond that of the political economy phenomena should be immediately evident to most. However, slavery's utterance only seems to be heard at the juncture of political economy as though that is the beginning and the end. Instead, we need to think about transatlantic slavery and indigenous colonization as the cultural revolution that is still unfolding in ways that remain deeply traumatic and must be reckoned with. Such a reckoning can be one in which we can, cannot be one in which we merely pinpoint victims and victimizers. It must grapple with the com complicated entanglements of histories and contemporary implication in each other's lives that range from Cherokee enslavement of black beings to Barack Obama as the president of a white supremacist settler colonial nation. And so how I'm sort of thinking with this passage and many of the other kinds of interventions emerging in this text are um, sort of thinking about, again, the seismic shift and also what does it mean to think about a, a Black diasporic politic? So let me give a little bit of context. Um, the research project that I started as a graduate student with Ronaldo Walcott, and that is now my book project, looks at the creative work of contemporary African-American and Black South African visual artists for how cultural taste value and institutions in the era of multiculturalism, so I'm thinking the 1990s to the contemporary moment, shape national identities of the United States and South Africa and reveal implicit values about who matters, who produces legitimate art, art and ways of doing resistance. And so in thinking about these two sort of regional spaces that certainly have overlapping and deeply diverging kind of um, cultural political histories, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I, the passage sort of invites a kind of implication to do deep work around two, two sort of regional spaces and two specific kinds of framings. And so while transatlantic slavery impacts the Americas, and we also have an opportunity to think through the colonial histories of South Africa, these spaces that both function as colonial and settler states um, that have participated in various iterations of racial segregationist histories and practices, whether um, it's through um, black death with law enforcement, land seizure and land seizures and past laws. Um, there's an opportunity to think through a kind of uh, relational kind of analytic between the two. And so the first the, the two things that I sort of want to flag in how this work has been helpful is on the one hand, thinking about transatlantic slavery and colonialism as these seismic shifts that are in, in, in entanglements and not sort of separate kinds of phenomena um, in the contemporary moment. And so one way that I think about this is when sort of thinking about the modern um, invention of the human subject, I think through historical figures like the Kosan woman, Kroitoa, um, in the context of South Africa, uh, who lives between 1643 and um, 1674, and is written, in, is written into South African history as one of the most written about um, indigenous folks, partly because she shows up within the context of um, the archive of the first governor of the Cape Colony, Jan Rybeck, but is also an interpreter. And then is later um, narrativized in particular iterations of the mother of the nation, um, taken up in, in certain kinds of ways. And so working through this kinds of configuration means that we have to sort of contend with some of these entanglements that Walcott points to in the passage that I flag. Um, the second piece that I, um, want to sort of highlight is the sort of return to a Black diaspora studies, but particularly the ways in which Walcott names this as a Black diaspora politic and what that kind of can do and, and, and offer, offer, particularly sort of within the context of a kind of larger set of debates that have sort of happened around whether Black diaspora function, can work in different sort of contexts and spaces. And so um, 
I, I think I'm going to just kind of turn to two passages that show up within chapter seven that for me have helped me think more about Black diaspora studies as a, as a politic um, in particular ways. And so, and, and, and I would say that this kind of shows up where Ronaldo kind of points to this question, why diaspora? Why, why, why a kind of continual sort of question of why diaspora, particularly when there are critiques that um, the Atlantic sort of um, might be overdetermined. And so I find it quite useful in his configuration that even within the kind of context of, of the Atlantic, it, it, it sets into place other kinds of iterations of movement and conquest and an empire that circulate in other kinds of waterways. So let me actually read um, a couple of passages that, that further operationalize this idea of black diaspora as a politic that I find so useful. And I'm hoping I can find the first one. So the first on page 28, Nonetheless, there is an ed, there, there is a link between these movements which center on the question of knowledge and institutions, by which I mean that Black diaspora thought allows us to see the way that knowledge circulates to, to form communities beyond the social relations of family, familial kinship. And I think this has particular resonance with later sort of passages where there's this explicit critique of the nation state itself and the ways in which the nation state always um, um, creates an entry point for um, a particular kind of genre of the human um, that we ne that never gets sort of worked out of. Um, the, the, the additional passage that I want to sort of point to, and I, I totally had this, but there was one passage where Walcott is talking a little bit about, um, here it is, it's on page 30, Black diaspora as a politic might be about something, how land, power, knowledge have come together to enact and unfold one of the longest unbroken colonial periods in human history. And so, um, what becomes really sort of helpful for me in sort of thinking through um, a kind of regional space like the United States, which would fit within the context of the Americas and then continental Africa and South Africa in particular, is that it invites this sort of conversation between the way culture and power and knowledge um, inform and shape and shape um, kind of contemporary sort of multicultural discourse, where it might be in the context of the U.S. as something like DEI initiatives or um, sort of political things that are happening within the context of a, my institution and a, a liberal arts institution in terms of thinking about um, how we even think about discipline to questions of kind of ushering new iterations of democracy and around frameworks like um, rainbow nationalism. So um, I, I kind of want to sort of pause there. I think that those are sort of two of the, the kind of big pieces that I'm constantly thinking through in my own work and, and with the students that I am so fortunate to work with. But one sort of last thing that I sort of want to leave with, um, perhaps with the Q&A, et cetera, is the way in which culture and the creative um, become sort of certain kinds of configurations, uh, I think in part for, for Ronaldo, whether it's through stylization or funk and music, um, how those um, bring forth um, um, glimmers or moments for a freedom um, to come, partly because the, the sort of objects that I am thinking about are in, in particular contemporary art by Black artists and the ways in which those, those, those objects, people do stuff with it. They circulate them in particular ways. They narrativize those work in particular ways. And what does it mean then in the contemporary moment when freedom and resistance continue to be um, kind of cons uh, considerable kind of rallying calls um, for intellectual work work on the ground, um, et cetera. So I will pause there and I look forward to more to come. Thank you so much, Sarah.
Uh, wait, I'm waiting to see whether or not my camera's kicked in. Ah, oh, there I am. Uh, and so, uh, thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Sarah. And we now move to our final presenter, uh, Dr. Chris Johnson. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Um, thank you, Vasuki, uh, the Center for Ethics and uh, WGSI U of T. Um, thank you for my co-panelists and all of your um, thoughtful uh, and urgent provocations thus far. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be here to celebrate my colleague, my comrade, my big brother, Ronaldo Walcott, um, and to celebrate long emancipation. Uh, so thank you, Ronaldo, for this gift um, and this challenge. Um, Christopher gave us a, a difficult, I might say cruel assignment in asking us to choose a single passage uh, that inspires us in our practice, broadly defined, um, especially given that every sentence, every syllable um, of long emancipation continues to so beautifully mash up um, you know, all of my orientations to method, uh, to pedagogy, to practice. Um, but if I, since I have to choose, I'm going to turn to uh, to chapter 17 on funk uh, <laughs> as well. And if you're following along at home, it's uh, I'll read from the end of uh, page 77 uh, to the second paragraph of page 78. Funk ethics, Walcott writes, forces us to simultaneously confront and deny the forces arrayed arrayed against the black life form that seek to even to take even the meager sustenance of life away from the black that classificatory system of modern colonial logics. As a type of the modern colonial order, the black is always positioned in regard to its possible extinguishability, even as it is the very type that makes the modern conceivable and possible, even as it is needed. Let me give another example from the annals of black music. I recently came across the story of how Charles Mingus would have a pot of soup on the stove in his apartment all day and sometimes simmering for weeks. Apparently he would add a carrot, some spice and something else to it as he attempted to get it right. Mingus's soup was always a certain kind of unfinished delicacy aiming for perfection and never reaching it, not wanting to reach it. Similarly, Mingus came to stop referring to his band and his tours by those terms. He, preter he preferred the term workshop instead. In Mingus's soup and his insistent that his band and, and tours were workshops, I find the suggestion of a certain too calm moment, a radical futurity and utopia that he refused to name, not unlike his funk brothers, but one he nonetheless knew we needed. What was being worked out? Why this desire to produce ongoing unfinished projects, projects that continually required revision? I would suggest that New World Black people play a function of reminding us that much is not yet finished, that life is a constant and unending revision, that conclusions are violent, violent orienting projects that preempt new forms of human life. The seductions of our moment offer up loose bromides on finished projects, like Obama being a culmination of some kinds of politics. But on closer inspection, the trajectory of those bromides is that the continued is, is the continued encirclement of black death life. Yes, black death life. Black people are born in death and must make lives out of it. So <laughs> this passage of like the book as a whole evokes a, a lot of things uh, from me um, here as in elsewhere you reckon with, um, as you write earlier, the deathly limits within the legal process of, man of emancipation the legislative practices of statecraft that work to make impossible black citizenship and even black belonging in nations, especially those designated Western. Civil rights and human rights discourses, you argue, contract or collapse when black subjects move. And as you've said elsewhere, when black people move and move for freedom, it puts other people's notions of freedom in crisis. So to start off, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, teaching as well. Um, so I'm, I'm currently teaching an undergraduate uh, course in the history of black people or black life forms in uh, that entity uh, called the United States. 
when I first started teaching uh, an iteration of that course, it was in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was during the Obama administration. At that time, frameworks like the long civil rights movement were in vogue. Uh, and Obama was on the co cover of a textbook that I uh, inherited, like the class, The Struggle for Freedom, which was edited by Claiborne Carson and others. Still, I tried to disrupt as much as I could uh, the assumption that rights, citizenship, national belonging for folks with paper citizenship or not were the sole or central political yearning uh, as means or as ends, and instead chart a, a discordant but woefully incomplete index of freedom struggle, as you write, struggles that are unfinished and yet to come. Despite the daily suffocating terror and reality of black death life for my students in Memphis, including the then recent murders of Rakia Boyd, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and closer to home, Darius Stewart, the equation of rights as freedom was difficult to undo. Despite, again, this being in the city of Memphis, which in no small part brands itself as the setting for Dr. King's assassination. Here, teaching in Canada, students seem much more eager uh, to explore these deathly limits of rights, the deathly limits of nation, the mirage of citizenship, and the impossibility of belonging in the United States. And even those students that <laughs> tend to inundate us with you know, reference letter requests for, for human rights law programs and so on. This of course reflects part of the elision of what you describe as Canadian coloniality and its many, many tentacles, as well as insidious comparisons that position anti-Blackness as elsewhere. And even as a colleague told me soon after arriving in Canada, uh, but you have to agree, it is better here. Alongside the contradictions, the hypocrisy, and perhaps absurdity of teaching a class enclosed by and that reifies the borders of the nation state, it's a curious thing teaching the history of Black life forms in the United States in a Canadian institution that until recently all but evacuated Black life forms from its history curriculum and as you write, in which Black people are made to disappear. By necessity, long emancipation, Black like who, and your larger body of work has forced me to embrace the Canada-US border as a pedagogical invitation. And in returning to that passage on Mingus, that life and freedom is a constant and unending revision. And so, you know, I try to do, uh, you know, several kinds of, you know, assignments in this history class that, you know, try to disrupt that disciplinary frame but one of which is invite uh, participants to um, you know, articulate their own freedom dreams, to position themselves within genealogies of cross-border movement, broadly defined as you, def you know, beautifully and broadly defined movement for us, and to take on what you call that constant and unceasing invitation, uh, that constant and unceasing invention, which to me at least communes with what Tony K. Bambara called the human responsibility to define, transform, to develop. Yet even there, I regularly receive these visions, these freedom dreams that largely reflect what you call reformist logics that retain the present shape of the world, including policy papers and recommendations for you know, state reform of all kinds, removing police from schools, um, you know, the state providing more housing, for instance. Last week, toward trying to encourage students to get started on their final assignment, I asked them to submit brief, uh, brief free rights uh, just asking them what inspired and enraged them in our current moment. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, most of them, if not all, addressed the war in Ukraine, while some condemned Putin's, quote, grieve, uh, Putin's greed and grievance and praised, quote, global showings of solidarity uh, for white Ukrainians. Most were incensed by the racist media comparisons, you know, the civilized, uncivilized stuff, as well as what one student called quote, the double standards of what the West considers unjust occupation. And additionally, the exclusion and violence against Black, Asian, and Arab refugees. And so those three rights brought me to, you know, another passage, also um, in the Funk uh, chapter in Newness, um, when through a, a rent, you write, quote, an ethical accounting is at stake. It is one in which the mathematics of humanness require a radical recalculation 
in which only revolution, this time global revolution, revolution beyond nation and nation state, beyond racial and gendered and ethnic categories and imaginaries, beyond the category of man, indeed in revolt against it, can produce the space and time of the freedoms we have not yet achieved, but that we desire. As you know, my current book project, I'm talking to you, Renata, sorry. I can't help but uh, address you, sorry. Um, uh, is grounded in part in ongoing conversations I've uh, had for now uh, about a decade with veterans of third world uh, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial movements uh, in Britain. Many of these conversations have revolved around disappointment, senses of disappointment and failure. Um, you know, that folks failed to eradicate you know, dismantle imperialism, eradicate racism, sexism, gender violence, and so on. But returning, uh, as well as, uh, I should say, a nostalgia uh, uh, and, of, of, and mourning for a loss of, of solidarities. And so returning again to Mingus and the workshop, that constant and unending revision and freedom yet, yet to come, I'm reminded of another narrative that emerged from um, those conversations. Um, and that by Gerlin Bean, an activist whose political wanderlust led her to, was just politically promiscuous and had just omnidirectional political itinerary um, in, in participating in all sorts of freedom movements in Jamaica, Zimbabwe and Britain. Uh, for her, she described this, uh, you know, her political biography and these, these struggles and campaigns as always interrelated and interlinked, not static. And as we de de discussed the de her decades of activism in pursuit of what she called the socialist ideal, she said something that echoes for me at least, your evocations of the unceasing search for radical intimacies and a desire to produce ongoing unfinished projects. That's what gives me the courage to continue being told me because I'm not expecting to see that end, but I think there's a continuum that goes on. And indeed, one of the many gifts of long emancipation is that it invites us to radically rethink, we use quote, radically rethink the possible modes of living a life in a system of relations that we need, but cannot yet imagine. The political urgency for a radical project of how to live life differently poses many demands and challenges to black studies and diaspora studies as I think we've been addressing um, and Professor Carol Boyce Davis did as well, as far as this ongoing project of, of decolonization, but also uh, the ever-present threats of uh, co-optation and pacification uh, within institutions like the university. So, you know, in the, in the, in, I'm, I'm, re I'm reminded as, you know, when you're charting for us or, or locating for us this, this exciting but also perilous moment for black studies in Canada right now which reminded me of June Jordan's reflection in 1969 on the emerging field of black studies. Um, inspired by black and four Puerto Rican students fourth demand for an open admissions policy at City College, Jordan saw the potential for black studies to abolish systems of education where quote, the powerful become more powerful, end quote. To Jordan, black studies rejected ep racist epistemologies as well as cultures of what you call crippling individuality that incubated greed, exploitation, divisions, and war within what she called the human community. Defining black studies as quote, studies of the person consecrated to the preservation of the person, Jordan heralded the field's potential to affirm the living black experience. If taken on by the university as a whole, this ethics of love Jordan foretold could build and forge alliances across communities and salvage humanity from extinction. Yet just five years later, Walter Rodney, no stranger to Canada or Canadian universities, was already criticizing forces within the academy that had sought to integrate, co-opt, and depoliticize the field in order to reinforce boundaries between teachers and students, theories and practice, praxis, scholarship and politics, the university and the so-called community. As you know, we're in a long overdue and again perilous moment of the institutionalizations of Black studies in Canada, which still remains largely non-institutional and smuggled. And I really love this attention to this, this you know, the non-institutional, this longer history, as well as the fugitive space of Black studies in the university. But as the seductions of inclusion, and I think echoing 
um, Sarah, as that uh, seductions of inclusion, the sensations, as you call it, of freedom, and the containment policies of DEI, EDI, loom ready to consume us. I'm inspired and challenged by your call for the open-ended, the inconclusive, and the op opportunities for freedom or funk. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And so with that, uh, we now turn to the second portion of the event where uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ronaldo Walcott to uh, generate our conversation with uh, his response. And thank you so much to uh, everyone thus far. Okay. Um, let me begin with some thanks. So thank you, Dr. Chris Smith, um, for, for, for doing this, for organizing this. And thank you to the Center for Ethics and Women and Gender Studies for supporting your idea and co-sponsoring this event. And to Fusuki, who is doing the behind the scenes work for hosting this conversation and bringing together um, friends and colleagues who, as you know, Chris, I um, so very much respect. So thank you, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Critchlow, and Dr. Smith, the other Dr. Smith. <laughs> so they're two, they're two Chris's and two, and two Smiths. And, and, and thank you for taking the work on those pages seriously enough to um, agree to engage with them in this kind of public forum. Of course, I, I was totally blown away um, by the fact that Carol took the time to make a video and send it to us. Um, Dr. Carl Boyce Davies has been um, in my intellectual and personal life for a really long time, um, from the time I was basically a kid. So is Dr. Critchlow too, actually, <laughs> in, in my late 20s. Um, and um, yeah, and Carol was my external examiner for my PhD and, and has been a long time person that I turned to for career advice. And she's been her and, I, I, yeah, I'll just come in to say this, you know, of course, one of the first things that I ever published was publishing a collection of essays that Warren Critchlow edited on Toni Morrison. And I wouldn't want anybody to read that essay now, but I think I, I wrote on Morrison's jazz. I was in my back teen period and, and I wrote on Morrison's jazz and, and answerability. <laughs> Warren and, and Cameron McCarthy, I think edited that, that, that that special issue. And, and, and then, you know, Carol has been someone who just really drew me into the profession and into black studies in, in the most beautiful and important ways that um, a young scholar who had just kind of finished their PhD could be pulled into the profession. You know, she, she made sure that I enter into conversation with people like Michael Hanchard and others who would read early drafts of my work back in those heady days of the mid 1990s when black studies was having this significant confrontation with cultural studies. And it really couldn't figure out where it wanted to go with it. It couldn't figure out whether or not it would have made more sense to incorporate the Black Brits who they were largely only engaging with into Black studies or to hold that tension. And, you know, Warren Critchlow, Carl Boyce Davies, Monima Lubiano, and folks like that were much more able to hold those tensions in place. And they became models for me to think with. And, for a long time, I would describe what I did as not just black studies, but as black cultural studies, as a way to bridge that kind 
that kind of divide. But let me turn to why we're really gathered here. You know, the phrase, the long emancipation is to me, has become for me a kind of really important marker of both the question of time and the question of how we might think about freedom. And so it's, it, it is for me at once the duration of what has come in, in the post-slavery world. It is also, of course, for me, a marker of how the afterlife of slavery continues to tether us to a particular kind of past. And when I think about that kind of past, I think about two texts that really kind of orient my thinking in, in the long emancipation. And I cite both of them, but you might not, you might not realize that they are the pillars of the argument that I'm making. Of course, there's idea heart and the scenes of subjection from, from which kind of thinking about how slavery remains never behind us slavery by another name continues to shape our, our present experiences. So there's that one monumental text. And then the second monumental text is Walter Rodney's How Europe Develop Underdeveloped Africa. And for me, both of those texts put all of black life, all of global black life in the realm of the afterlife of slavery. So it doesn't matter whether or not you were descendants of people who came to the Americas. If you're black in this world, you live in the afterlife of slavery. It doesn't matter whether or not your ancestors left the continent. If we take, if we take Rodney serious, that slavery interrupted something that we might call African civilization, then all of Africa lives in the afterlife of slavery too. And that's what really animates, it's that kind of thinking that really animates um, the, 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 the thinking that I'm trying to do in, 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 the, in this long essay. And then of course, the, the third pillow, pillar of that is Kamal Braffitt's work around the kind of question of catastrophe and what he calls the culture of catastrophe. And it's those three pillars that are really animating what I try to do in this work. And of course, I was really pleased when Chris told me that Warren would pa participate in this conversation because I know that Warren's um, deep knowledge of jazz and of music and of bop and post-bop of avant-garde jazz would help us to think deeply about the other ways in which expressions of Black freedom find themselves animated. And, um, and I was really pleased that, that Warren would turn to um, the fact that yes, he is maybe a decade older than me and so has another into, <laughs> another into a particular scene of the musical and its own relationship to questions of freedom. And I'm really glad that today, Warren, you invoked um, the Match Roach um, Freedom, Freedom Now Suite because in, a, in an earlier, essay, bits and pieces of which show up in the book, in which I respond to Christina Sharp's In the Wake. Um, I titled that essay, Freedom Sweet Now. Um, in my response to Christina, in which I think that her work was enacting um, or raising the questions that I think that that album we insist now so brilliantly raise. What happened is, that when I got the, 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 um, the proofs for, for, the, for that essay, I, I accidentally edited out <laughs> the title of, of the album <laughs> from the final proofs. <laughs> so this, this question of um, we insist freedom sweet now, the way in which a particular kind of musical archives shapes the question of freedom for black people is uppermost in my mind. And, 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 and the reason that is, it, it remains uppermost in my mind, especially in relationship to something that we might call jazz. But you know, as you know, in the book, I also turn to, to um, 
to bam, all of a sudden his name just went right out of my head. But I'll come, it'll come back to me. Um, it's that I think that black music does that very important pedagogy of keeping us both within the realm of ideas and thought and on the street. So Warren, you, you had phrased it in your talk as the academy in the street, but I would, I, I, I'll, I'll rephrase it as within the realm of the world of ideas in the street. The black music operates at a site of intellectual engagement that allows us to think about its own contributions at the same time that it does not have to distance itself from something that we might call the street. And so I think black, black music is able to do something that black studies desires or claims that it wants to do, but it's never able to do, that it becomes actually much more, black studies becomes actually much more easily enfolded into um, the disciplinary apparatus of the academy in a way that black music never actually does. And that even our studies of black music in the academy um, in some ways often tends to depart from black music itself um, because they become disciplined um, by, by the academy. And I think in some ways that kind of argument can be extended to um, Sarah's comments and the manner in which Sarah works with art and thinks with art, that black art, that black art always seems to be in excess of the very structures and strictures that seeks to contain it. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it was interesting to me that, that Sarah went to a couple of places, to capitalism, to diaspora, and to human alterability. And it seems to me that, you know, and I'm gonna use this phrase, even though I, I hate it, but I can't think of a better word now, but it seems to me that the best black art does exactly that, right? Uh, which is not to take music outside the category of art, but now I'm thinking visual art, that the best black art does exactly that. It is in excess of capital, even though capital tries to discipline it and, 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 and pull it into certain kinds of market logics. It is always in some ways pushing back against that disciplinary nature of, of, capital, of the capitalist market. Um, it inevitably, um, pushes beyond the boundaries of the national to articulate a certain kind of diaspora sensibility, a certain kind of diaspora politics, which means that it often pushes back against the boundaries of the nation state. It complicates the boundaries of the nation state while not necessarily always eschewing them. And at the same time, it offers us some insight into um, the alterability of of the species that we have named the human. And of course, as you know, I really, I really struggle with the question of the human in this text. Um, so while I'm, I'm not making an argument for um, European humanism, I'm making an argument against European humanism. I'm also not of uh, the school of thought that European humanism is the only story that we have on what it means to name the species human. And so I really kind of grab, grapple with that. And, and in grappling with that, I move to the notion of, of life forms. And this idea of life forms is for me an adaptation of Sylvia Winter's notion of, of, of new forms of social life. And, um, and so, you know, across a number of essays, Winter insists that new forms of social life are possible. And, and she offers that as a counter to um, the stultifying, limited, anti-Black European notions of the human. But again, Winter is someone who's not, in my view, um, throwing out the category of the human as though only Europe can own that category. And since, and since we don't fit Europe's category, um, we can't work with this thing that we call the human. Instead, she's offering us I think another way around. And I think that we see, we see that alterability expressed in, black, in certain kinds of black visuality. 
in the kinds of black visuality that you work with Sarah that lead you to this place of trying to articulate this, this thing called bafflement. Um, so, um, you know, the, the question of, of human alterability in the hands of black people here and there um, is one that we're continually coming to. And of course, in the book, I try to show a bunch of different ways in which, um, you know, the, this human alterability occurs and happens. And Chris, I, I you know, the, the question of, of revision and, 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 and the unfinished business of, of the nature of, of politics, of freedom, of black life, the unfinished nature of the black life form and its constant revision. I hope that in that people would hear, you know, one of the, one of the influences in my thinking um, since at least the late 1980s in, into, into the present. And, and that's, the, that's the work of Paul Gilroy. You know, um, the Black Atlantic Modernity and Double Consciousness was published in, in 1993 or something like that. But, you know, and that's the, that's the, the, the book where Gilroy really articulates modernity as an, as an unfinished project. And, and while I think my thinking about modernity has now come into some tension with how I think Gilroy thinks it there, I do think that there that there, that the, the the notion of of revision of unfinishedness um, is an important one to hold on to. So for me these days, it's not so much a question of um, of the unfinished ideals of modernity that I'm after. It's more a question of what would it, for me. It's more a question of the unfinished notion of emancipation. What would, and for me, the unfinished notion of emancipation arrives at the kind of logic of freedom that I try to articulate in the opening pages of this long essay, which is this kind of question of bodily autonomy and sovereignty in a non-hierarchical and non-violent non -violent world. But this kind of question of, of, of revision and unfinishedness is one that I learned over the years, not only from, from Gilroy's profound um, contributions in the Black Atlantic and other essays, um, There Ain't No Black in the Union, Jack, that book prior to the Black Atlantic and so on, but from the work of Hazel Carby, again, from the work of Carl Boyce Davies in her book, Migrations of the Subject, from, from Saidia Hartman's work in Lose Your Mother, from Edward, from Kamal Braffitt's poetry and, and essays, um, again, from Walter Rodney's work, and importantly, from the work of Darida. You know, Darida's open-endedness of the to come, which, which is what I borrow from, is for me um, the opening to not the question of, of a, a conclusion that, um, a, a conclusion that orients us to, to a manner of living that no longer needs revision, but really opens us up to what I think, what, what I think for me is the kind of question of, of the ongoing need for, again, to return to winter, um, new, a new descriptive statement of what life might be a new descriptive statement of what um, the black life form might be, um, or put another way, a new narrative account of what the modern has wrought for us. And, and to me, um, that's like really crucial to thinking about what kinds of social, political, cultural, economic relations that we are willing to align ourselves with. And I'm going to conclude that by way of saying something about, you know, the book ends on this moment of no future. And I'm writing about, um, I'm writing about the lack of an institutionalized Black studies in Canada 
and 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 trying to make in part a little case for black studies as occupying the, occupying a site of non-institutionality as as something that is important uh, and maybe something that's important to hold on. And Chris, your comments really, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't think that, that we would end up here, but your comments really made me think about something that I saw this week, which was a, a job ad from Dalhousie University for a two-year contractually limited appointment in Black Studies where the successful candidate would not only teach the introductory courses to Black Studies and other kinds of courses, but this, this, this temporarily employed person will also be mandating with helping to um, do the administrative work to develop their Black Studies major. And that really kind of opened up the kind of question for me about, about some of the things I was trying to do in this book, right? Like, what, would it, what does it mean to establish Black Studies on cheap labor? What does it mean to establish Black Studies probably on the exploited labor of a Black surplus PhD? And how, how does then a certain kind of logic of slavery continue to shape even Black inclusion into these, into these institutions? And how does a particular kind of logic of slavery continue to shape even how our desires to be represented in these institutions shape up? Because I'm sure that it wasn't just a VP of academic who came up with that ad, right? That that ad had to be discussed with faculty members somewhere in some department at some meeting, some kind of configuration of people with full-time jobs who desire to have Black studies at that university. Um, but somehow that's what we end up with. And so it's this kind of, it is this kind of question of what happens when Black life shows up in ways that it makes a demand? How is that demand responded to? And often that demand, even when it appears as a demand that is, that is meant to accommodate, and that in of itself that I have to turn to the word accommodate should tell us the problem in the first, mark the problem in the first instance, that it's meant to accommodate, that what it does is it pulls us back in to a set of strictures that mark the on freedom, that marks on freedom for black livability. And yet in between all those spaces, part of what I'm arguing in this book is, and yet in between all those spaces, the black life form creates a life. So we're, we're neither um, made destitute and victim, nor are we interested in the sto story of heroism or the story of rising to the horizon of a kind of white, late modern, um, position and condition. And, and, I, and so I think I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I think that that last story or example really fits that narrative of what it would mean to rise to a kind of white, late modern condition in which one remains subjected all the while believing that you have reached some kind of horizon. And so I, I'll stop there and Maybe we can take it from there. I hope I was coherent. <laughs> I'll give some time for uh, our uh, colleagues to think about uh, what their response was. I did have a question for myself, and so I'm taking liberty uh, as moderator. Uh, you had mentioned uh, in your response uh, that one of the key thinkers that you were thinking through is Derrida, in, partic uh, in, partic uh, in particular. And when I was reading this chapter, uh, when I was reading this chapter, it, all it also came across my news feed that there was, uh, there's a show in the works uh, through HBO called We Own the City. 
which basically is kind of a historical drama that's documenting uh, uh, documenting the incidents in the context of the death of Freddie Gray. And I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, you were talk uh, the way in which you utilize Derrida to think about iteration, uh, repetition, uh, which also came up, uh, I think, in various ways to all of the panelists and thinking about the spec, but specifically in uh, in the chapter, hold on, <laughs> uh, Catastrophe, Wake, and uh, Hauntology, uh, the, spectacular, uh, the spectacularization of Black Death. And it prompted me this morning to think about what is it that we're doing when we're having these moments where we think that art is going to do some sort of work of justice? Or is it merely just another, like another iteration or repetition of the spectacle of Black violence and Black death? Well, I mean, like for instance, because I know something about Sarah's work, like I don't think that the work that Sarah is studying and writing about is is art that is meant to to do justice, um, but rather art that is meant to give another account of the world that we presently inhabit and have inherited, and its multiple legacies. What I'm trying to do there with that section on on um, on thinking with Christina Sharp's in the wake. Um, Jack Derrida's um, ha The Hauntological and Kamau Braffitt's Catastrophe. I was thinking about a spectacle though, right? It's a spectacle that got me there. The spectacles of Black Death crossing the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar and headed to Lampedusa. And as you know, in that section, I kind of write about, I was like, why should I know the word Lampedusa? Like that should not necessarily be a word that I know, but I ended up knowing it because of the spectacle of African and other not white bodies um, packed on ships, packed on boats, um, showing up drowned, bloated on the shores of the Mediterranean. And part of what I was trying to work out there is how the culture of catastrophe that's inaugurated by, by, by the post 1492 European expansion haunts the present moment. And so for me, there's something useful in the triangulation of reading um, Sharps in the wake and Sharps news of the wake as both the unfinished project of mourning or dead, but in mourning or dead in that moment, we also mourn the violence and brutality of post 1492 European expansion that produced a catastrophe, not just for black people, but for indigenous peoples in the Americas. And how that ongoing catastrophe that manifests itself in what I call the extension of the middle passage across the Mediterranean haunts our present discourse of freedom, our present discourses of capitalism, our present discourses of the nation state. And that's why the, con the, the, the larger conceit of this, of this book, of this essay is that when black people move, a crisis occurs. And it doesn't actually take a lot of black people to move to make that crisis occur. As I point out in the book, most African refugees don't actually make it to Europe or across, or across the Mediterranean. They remain on the African continent. So they, they move from, um, from where, um, a catastrophe has occurred to them, for them, somewhere else on the continent, but they don't actually make it to Europe. So the idea that Africans wanted to cross the Mediterranean, produce a refugee crisis for Europe, is in and of itself a part of the process, the ideological process of being haunted. Europe is haunted by its own um, by its own practices, its own extractive practices, its practices, its deadly practices, its practices of confinement, and its claim 
that only European white men are able to, in some ways, move around the world freely. And that's why at the end of the book, I also make this, it's, it's, it's both serious and not, that if anybody can fully claim the world as a global citizen, it's black people, right? And, I'm, I'm, and I, I throw that out as a way to, to make the claim that the catastrophe, the catastrophe that inaugurates this world in some ways also produces a profound estrangement for black people, both who are the descendants of the continent and black people on the continent still. And again, all of that for me is really filtered through taking quite seriously um, Walter Rodney's arguments in how Europe underdeveloped Africa. I might point out that this year's 50 years of the publication of um, how Europe underdeveloped Africa and the Walter Rodney Foundation on March 27th is going to have um, a, an online um, celebration and engagement with, with that book. But I think that if we take Rodney seriously, um, that- Walter Rodney's argument in oh, on the developed Africa. I might point out that this year, 50 saying, years of the publication. Why am I hearing myself? <laughs> okay. Um, certain, kind of, kind of, certain kind of doubleness that's taking place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what I was going to say, if, but if we take Rodney's, if we take Rodney's argument seriously, um, you know, this is not the, the 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 question is not one. The question of the afterlife of slavery, the question of a post slavery world, is it, not one only for for black people of the Americas. Um, it is one for black people globally. So I, I hope that answer, like, you know, there's the question of ontology that, that, that I draw from Derrida, but, but for me, the important thing that I draw from Derrida in thinking through these questions is the open-endedness of what he, what he phrases in his later writings as a democracy to come. I take the democracy off because I'm less interested in, Darida's local, as Richard Hyten has taught us, that Darida and Foucault and them are reading, they're very local, which is Europe. And I'm interested in a kind of Black global. And I'm interested in what this Black global to come opens up for us and, and the possibilities of that. And although I was thinking while you were talking about Europe, I was reminded of M.A. Césaire and this notion of the boomerang effect. I mean, I think this is very interesting that ontology, this idea that the engagement, or so is there is thinking about the engagement of Europe and imperialism and colonialism all those years now, boomerangs back mm -hmm. to, to Europe. And I think we see this quite clearly in the, in the Ukraine and the emerging war in, in Europe. Um, and it's also, I think, quite astounding thinking of borders and, and diaspora that you, we have this incredible diaspora here. Sort of, Stuart Hall said the diaspora re-diasporized, <laughs> coming back, <laughs> boomeranging back into Europe and, you know, creating this kind of juxtaposition of, um, you know, of border crossings and repetitions of crossings and the history of, of terrible crossings of of borders that are so embedded in the history of Europe in the 20th century. And, you know, we, we can sort of name a couple of them uh, off the top. And so um, I'm wondering if you've ever thought about Césaire in relationship to your, to, to your work and uh, not so much to his literary thinking, but his attempt to think about the very question of colonialism uh, mm -hmm. as a, a kind of lens onto both the ongoingness of trying to think through uh, what it means to understand uh, emancipation across the shifting historical conjunctures that it moves and how those conjunctures force a sort of change in how we think. I think one of the things your work does is sort of return us to emancipation in a new historical moment that forces us to have to think about it radically differently as you, as you are proposing to do. So wondering, Césaire, what, what might he contribute <laughs> to this discussion? Yes, I do think about Césaire, but I don't work with Césaire as much as I probably should. I, I generally 
turn to um, Glissant. But I think what, what Césaire does that to me is, does for me that I think is in kind of concert with what I was trying to do in The Long Emancipation is his unmasking of what Europe calls its ideals and, and his unmasking of those ideals as not only unfinished, and this is why now I see as much as I, I, I remain um, deeply influenced by, by Professor Gilroy's thinking um, about the unfinished project of, of modernity, I can see how my own thinking now comes into a little bit of a tension with it. You know, Cicero really unmasked that unfinished project, but not only does he unmask it, he, he really helps us to see how it, it is founded on a fundamental lie because it's founded on the violence and brutalities inflicted on others to make its own claim. And I, I think in many ways I have come to that kind of positioning too. So for me, I'm less interested in the unfinished ideals of modernity. I'm much more interested in, you know, the kind of Sylvia Winter and Fanonian take. So, so Fanon is interested in um, a new leap of invention and Winter is interested in drawing on Césaire, mind you, um, a kind of new descriptive statement of what life might be, or a new narrative, or a different narrative account of life as it is, so that something else might come into being. And it's 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 in that way that you know in some, that that Césaire operates for me. So he's like the figure behind these two other thinkers who are really shaping how I think about what I'm trying to do. Yeah, but I'm not, I, I haven't explicitly engaged with Cesar in the way that I really should. But maybe the, the book that I'm trying to write after this queer book, which is this book about freedom and the sea, where I'm gonna come back to freedom and, and, and think more concretely about white European modernist freedom in relationship to these kinds of thinkers. Maybe I'll engage with Césaire much more. I kind of have a question um, for you, because you, you um, and this is kind of moving back to sort of, you know, I'm thinking more about sort of aesthetics, but also mm -hmm. kind of duality, because you moved to the photographer, um, I'm going to forget his name, but um, as I think you're walking through um it's not checkpoint charlie but then also yeah, the cover, it is. but then the also the cover of your book is a work by Terquasi dyson um who's a, a painter um and so i'm just kind of wondering i'm just gonna say a bunch of things and hopefully it'll be co coherent mm. i'm thinking of those two um that that you sort of draw on and then this relationship to black life form and i know that you talk about it in relation to sort of wrestling with humanism um and um and doing that through winter. And I also know that some of your earlier writing kind of thinks about winter's decipherment practice to then think about it in terms of film. So where am I going with all of this? I'm wondering um, in your sort of framing of this idea of black life, life form as a sort of way to get around um, a different kind of human, it's it's funny that 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 sort of conceptual phrasing completely reminds me of form within the context of visual kind of aesthetics and that might be a bit of a huge detour but where i'm going with that is i'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit more about your use of black life form and how that even takes shape with these sort of two more visual based artists that you make use of oh thank you that's 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 really great i mean as you as you know, in so much of my my previous writing and thinking, even though I'm trained as a sociologist, I'm writing about literature, film, music, art, and so on. And that's been a significant like cultural expression, cultural production has been the thing that has driven my thinking most often. Um, so while this, while this work does not explicitly discuss particular kinds of work of 
cultural expression, a lot of what I was thinking about was informed by um, particular works of cultural expression. So Paula Nazareth, the Brazilian artist um, whose work um, I, I first encounter at an art gallery at Checkpoint Charlie in, in, um, in Berlin, um, really got me thinking about the repeating, like, you know, Benny Thoreau has talked about repeating island and um, Kimberly Bonita Brown talks about the repeating, what does she call it? The repeating black mother? Is it the repeating body? Yeah, the repeating body, the repeating body. And because I'm, I, and, and Paula Nazareth really got me thinking about the repeated nature of the brutal violence of Europe in the Americas. And to see it, to see the work displayed at at that juncture, of course, I was at Checkpoint Charlie well after 89, the collapse of the wall and so on. But to see that work um, displayed at that juncture, at that nexus of difference, but at that nexus that also made something called Europe possible, right? So we've invoked Ukraine here, right? It is the violence of the Americas that makes something called Europe possible. They don't have that language of Europe without what they do in the Americas, right? So this this kind of repeated notion of brutality, and so it's not. It was not at all surprising to me that African students, Caribbean students, who are marked as black in contemporary Ukraine at the moment of violence and war, that they too didn't just experience the violence of the war but they experience the violence of the people who are claiming that war is being enacted on them as they try to move. Because immediately, the thing that makes Europe, Europe it's the spectacularization of the black body. Europe is only a form because it has the black body and the indigenous body as a spectacularized other, as the thing that it is definitely not, as the thing that it can in some way, shape and form appear to control. And so, so the violence says that the borders are not at all surprising within that logic. And so what Paula Nazareth's work made me think about was that kind of repeating violence and the abstraction of Torquoise Dyson's, um, the kind of bow of the, the boat, you know, is for me, again, the kind of question of black movement. And, 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 and her, her work um, inspires me to think about um, the limits of a certain kind of representation when, um, when we want to think about um, Black movement, Black trauma, as in the long historical trauma, not individualized trauma, and the question of catastrophe. Right? What does it What does it mean? And I'm not necessarily suggesting that this image. I, I haven't asked her that this Im image on the cover of the book is the bow of a slave ship. But what does it mean to abstract the bow of a slave ship? What What does it mean to refuse that kind of representation of form? And this brings us back to the chapter on funk, to jazz, to bop, to how young black men style their bodies that the question of form is so fundamentally central to something that we might call the black life form. And it's not just the form that we're making for ourselves, it's how others have to form themselves against us too. It's how others can only see their own form because we exist, right? And, and that, that, that was profoundly clear at the Polish-Ukraine border, and for months early, it was profoundly clear at the Belarus-Polish border where black people and others and Syrians and other people of color are continue to die in the, in the coal forest on that other side of the border um, because their form is not the European form. And, you know, and so people will say, oh, but you know, black people have been in Europe you know, for six, seven hundred, eight years. That's not the point. 
<laughs> the point is that Europe understands itself in opposition to people who who are not who, who are not marked in that way. So it's it's not the this is not a question of 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 empiricality. This is a question of the manner in which the function of ideas shape the world that we inhabit, which is why Winter makes always come back to making a case around narration, because in some ways you can read Winter saying, what we narrate or how we narrate the world makes the world. Um, which is not to do this kind of linear that you narrate the world and then something falls into place. But she's, but she's really telling us that narration is, is so fundamental to um, how we live the world, how we experience it, what the world is. I was thinking, Ronaldo. I mean, um, I mean, reading this book, it some may find it trivial, but these ideas of the body and movement, I find all of this really most attractive in in the book and and provocative. And I was thinking while I was reading of the um, the late Jamaican photographer um, Peter Dean Rickards, um, and I saw his work at the uh, at the um, fragments of epic memory, you know, this um, image or video he makes of that captures those, those young men performing dance hall movements, um, I, it, almost on the edge of, you know, complete improvisation that it could fall apart at any moment, but held together in such this fantastic way. And these young boys watching this, taking it all in, um, this idea of the um, the you know form and formation, and, um, and maybe the, the deformation of form, as you you uh, sort of briefly quote some. Um, oh, God, Baker. I his name. Then. Houston Baker. Houston Baker, right? I think it's really quite quite um, amazing, and again the uh, I think in. Rickard's work in particular, the juxtaposition of um, uh, time and temporality, uh, the, the slowing down of the body and the, the melancholy nature of the, of the music itself that sort of defies what one might think of as, as dance hall itself, opens up a whole set of notions of, I think what you're um, speaking about is this, this ongoing uh, engagement with the very idea of of, of freedom and pushing the boundaries of freedom, not only for the, to free the body, but to bring a new kind of freedom into the world itself. I think this is one thing that maybe art or um, artist work, uh, you know, that is really interesting work uh, tends to do and provoke in, in thinking. And I think the, the ideas of the body um, and movement and style um, that you bring uh, back to us in in this work are really quite quite significant and change the way that one begins to look at and and desire certain kinds of image work in you know in contemporary art and, and in other forms of representation. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Now well, we're going to, we're, oh, okay, now you, okay. Um, so I didn't know if we were going to go to the audience, but I did, you know, if there is space for a question, I was, you know, mm -hmm. as far, I'll avoid the kind of ongoing, that kind of tension in Black studies and cultural studies, you know, obviously that's still um, there. But I was wondering, you know, in the context of Gilroy, just generally, I was very interested in your approach to, your approach to land. Um, and sovereignty and, uh, you know, belonging to land at one point, you know, you, uh, you know, maybe a, a kind of radical discourses and practices might want to refuse the logics of belonging to a place. Um, and as that related to diaspora studies, of course, I was hearing Gilroy as it pertained to the kind of homeland. Um, but I was also um, interested, yeah, so perhaps we can, I am interested in, in what you're saying about land and these kind of obstacles to 
kind of radical intimacies, as you say it. And also I'm interested in this concept of mobile associations. Um, but there's this moment at which uh, you, you go to, uh, we're, we're new here, Gil Scott Heron and Jamie XX. And it's the remix there. And, you know, gesturing, I didn't know if that was kind of just, I heard Gilroy as far as like his work on, <laughs> particularly in Ain't No Black and the Union Jack and looking at, you know, punk and, and ska and, and, and so on. But I didn't know if that was, I just wanted to hear more about what you were saying about the remix there. And if at all that relates to a kind of, you know, uh, this radical intimacies. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that, Chris. Like the funny thing about, you know, for me, the invocation of, of Jamie XX and Gil Scott Heron, um, we're new here. Jamie XX remixing Gil Scott Heron, we're new here. There's a whole lot going on there for me about questions of funk, about questions of racial intimacy. Even behind that, for me, I'm thinking about um, Baldwin's essay, um, The Black the black boy meets the white boy. Is that the way the title goes? And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, like I'm playing with a set of metaphors and I'm hoping that people who are inside a certain kind of orientation to black studies and black thinking will get some of these, these, these resonances. But the kind of question like, you know, to kind of like, so it's, it's a riff, but I'm trying to think about the, with the question of land like to me, diaspora in its most radical formation, it's not about dispersal. It's about refusing the post-slavery nation state as a site of any kind of black possibility. So of course, all people who are diasporized are landed somewhere, right? We're not up in the air. And many of the places that we are landed in um, constitute themselves as nation states but we don't have to constitute ourselves as belonging to those nation states. We can constitute ourselves as acting politically and consciously from within those political formations while desiring other kinds of political formations. But like I said, by the time when I get to the book and I say, get to the end of the book, and I say that black people are really the only true global citizens, I'm really saying, fuck the nation state that everywhere we look, even in the punitively black nation stakes, black life is under significant and deep threat, right? Whether it's Barbados, <laughs> whether it's South Africa, whether it's Zimbabwe, whether it's Mozambique, whether it is Ethiopia, whether it's Somalia, whether it's the UK, show me a place where black life is not under significant and serious threat. And what is the container of that? It's something called a nation state. So when, when Carl went back to one of my very early essays, be, which is called Beyond the Nation Thing, right? <laughs> that essay is called Beyond the Nation Thing. Um, and, and, and I end with um, Dion Brand's um, land from, um, a line from Land to Light On. Um, you know, I think that there, that there are a bunch of us uh, and and I think from you know from from years of being in conversation with Dion Brand, where you know, of course we have certain sentimentalities in relationship to particular kind of political geographies that we come out of. But the question of how to live a black life that might approach something like freedom, right? Because we don't know because we haven't had it, but might approach something like freedom it's pretty clear that the nation state in it. And so the kind of question of land and how land has returned as so fundamental to a particular kind of discourse of post-colony, post-colonialism uh, and so on. It's one that for anyone who's committed to a diaspora, a, di a radical diaspora politics is something that's going to trouble us because we know, we know that when people claim lands, that other people are ejected from those lands. For everyone who claims lands about something, somebody else is told, well, this is not your land. And what that means, so this, this raises really, and let me be clear, 
I know exactly what this means. This raises really difficult questions for claims around indigeneity around the world. Not just in North America, we see the same kind of thing happening in South Africa. We see it happening in Palestine. The question of land and claims to land as a kind of foundational claim of how to make political community is one in a post-Columbus world that is deeply, deeply fraught. And we do ourselves no good in imagining new forms of political community if we fall back into it in any kind of easy fashion. And I can hear all kinds of people saying that that dude is saying indigenous people should not get their land back. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> I want to jump in here because uh, um, we have time for one question and then some oh, sorry. kind of wrap. Oh no, not at all. Uh, I tried to private message you and. Uh, and basically the audience is in awe and so uh, and there's actually inquiries about like the names and titles of the names and titles of the books behind your bookshelf because it's marvelous uh, so the question actually comes from uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, the uh, fellows at the Center for Ethics as part of the Research Ethics, uh, sorry, uh, Race, Ethics, and Power Project. And we were actually discussing uh, most recently uh, chapters uh, 14 and 15, No Happy Story, and I Really Want to Hope. And what comes up in both those chapters is that uh, you push us to think not just about uh, the impact of coloniality, but also the complicities within racialized communities. And so going against the grain of how colonial studies is traditionally done by calling attention to the need to study the accomplices. And I'm wondering how you might speak to that. And you've kind of touched on this, especially in terms of how we understand indigeneity, indigeneity and relation to land, but also you like you speak about this in relation to the pursuit of property, which are both intertwined. Look, I'm gonna try to be, be brief so that we can, yeah. Look, I, look one of the things that after, after thinking about the kinds of thinking that went into trying to write the long emancipation, and then writing on property and returning to think about freedom and in particular, the other coming catastrophe or the catastrophe that is inaugurated by the catastrophe we're still living, which is climate change. Has me a lot thinking about, you know, and I've written just one thing where I'm trying to begin to explore this with two things where I'm trying to explore this. Like have me thinking about, so what kind after, in the aftermath of the catastrophe of European expansion post-1492, a new world is made. It's a new world for everybody in it, right? So there's the double entendre of the new world in the Americas for Europeans and Africans bought as forced labor. And it's a new world for the indigenous people in the region too, because they get subjected to other forms of life that they didn't bargain for. So it, it's a new world. And the kind of question is, with, that, with the invention of that new world and living still in the catastrophe that was inaugurated by it, are we capable of us as a species to make another new world? Are we capable as a species to make a world that can allow us to not, not pretend that those wounds and injustices and brutalities and so on didn't happen. But can we engage that leap of invention where we are not entirely and totally captive to that past and make something else? That is the thing that it seems to me that we are faced with 
Some people would say that the only way we can approach that is if we can reconcile what happened post-1492 and got us to where we are at in 2022. And they might be absolutely right. My question though for that is, we have been trying to reconcile that for a really, really long time in a way that has not bought us, and I'm not seeking resolution, but have not bought us into the kinds of community formations that might be necessary for us to invent something new. That in fact, so many of our models, and I think you know, the work of Nandita, Shur Nandita Sharma is, is really brilliant on this. So many of our models have turned to the language of nationalism, the language of sovereignty, the language of, of land and territorial claims in ways that establish an us and a them, in ways that establish a native and a non-native. And that has not produced the kind of transformation that is necessary in the kind of global system, the kind of global system or systems that European that European global expansion has inaugurated and that we continue to live in. So we are in some ways, in my, in my, my reading of the situation is that we're in a stalemate and, and we're in a stalemate where Fanon's leap of invention is like screaming at us, right? Fanon is saying we can, we can do something else. We don't have to be perpetually trapped by Europe's captivity of us as peoples of particular races. We don't have to be perpetually trapped by Europe's narrative that some of us are indigenous to a place and others, and others of us are not. We don't have to be, because that's still Europe's order of the world, right? Even in its most radical articulations, it is still Europe's order of the world. But Europe's order of the world have also, has also brought us into certain kinds of intimacies that allow us to imagine anew, to, to riff off of Sylvia Winter, to reinvent, right? And, and Winter is rifting off of Césaire, right? To reinvent anew the world that, that we have. And so that's, so that's where I, I'm not dancing around the question of sovereignty, because I think these are all compromises at political points in time. So yeah, give indigenous peoples their land back, but give them their land back knowing that we're still all living in particular kinds of intimacies. So we still got to figure out what kind of political community we make after we've given that land back, because obviously, you know, we're not going anywhere. So what kind of political communities do we make in that moment, right? And those are, I think those are the questions that many of us are fearful to ask because those questions strike at the heart of um, the, the, at the heart of the manner in which we have inherited the European legacies that keeps Europe at the top of the pyramid, so to speak. <laughs>